Um, we're going to sing a, a special song for our family this morning. Uh, it's one that we sing a lot. People that uh, come up to our house hear us sing this all the time. And uh, one of our friends we were talking to last night, we told him that we had special music today. And they said, well, you could do just a closer walk with thee. So a lot of you have heard us sing that, and we've sung this song with you. Um, but one thing that I wanted to point out is, you know, sometimes we sing songs over and over, and, and we enjoy them each time we sing them, but we don't sometimes stop and look at some of the words. And I just wanted to point out a couple. It's the, st the song starts out by saying, I am weak, but thou art strong. How many can you relate to that? Through this world of toil and snares. I think all of us can relate to that too. But the chorus, just a closer walk with thee, granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee, let it be, Lord, let it be.
quite a number of people, whether they believe in Christ or not, are at least talking about it this time of year. Just so happens that the calendar falls on the same um, day of the week that uh, it happened years ago. Thursday night, Friday uh, night, and the actual Passover uh, was Thursday night, Friday, just as it was back then. So the days of the week correspond this time. It also happens to be an eclipse of the moon, and some people think, well, it's quite an omen. Well, it's just coincidence. It's nothing extra special is going to happen, though some people think so. What I want to do is review with you some of the events and some of the testimony, because then we have to make up a decision again. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so everyone might believe his testimony. So Jesus prepared ahead of time someone to go before him to let, give people a chance. We often don't like surprises. And so just somebody uh, appearing, claiming to be the Messiah, at least there's a forerunner saying, yes, he's coming. Look for him. John himself was not the light, Scripture says. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. And we're reading from John chapter 1, uh, starting with verse 6. And starting 9, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created. The world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with physical birth, resulting from human passion or pain, but a birth that comes from God. So, the Word became human, made His home among us, and He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Right here, He switched to the personal sense. So the writer of this testimony, which happens to be not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, he is the one who says, yes, we've seen, we've experienced this, we know this to be true. John the Baptist testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed far uh, long before me. From his abundance we have all received gracious blessing after one after another. But the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. So he is contrasting, you know, through Moses we got the law, and that's important, but through Jesus we got something more than the law. We got love, and we got his faithfulness. No one has ever seen God but the unique one. And this is an interesting phrase that the Greek uses here, monogenes, the unique one, the only one that has ever been, and ever will be, who is himself God, he is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Just think about that concept. This person, Jesus Christ, is the one who is revealing Christ, or revealing God to us, because he can do it in a personal fashion. Well, Pharisees came. They heard about what was going on. They had to figure out what was... Uh, what was this fellow out there in the wilderness baptizing people? What was his mission? Who was he? So when they came, the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask a big question. Who are you? What are you doing? What are you here for? Right away, he didn't hesitate. He said, I'm not the Messiah. Well, then who are you? They're asking of John the Baptist. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet we're expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer. What do you say about yourself? So 
John repeats the words from Isaiah. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Well, that doesn't give them quite what they want to hear. So they said, if you're the Messiah, if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the prophet, who gave you the right to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave or untie the scraps of his sandal. Well, the next day, we're in verse 29 now. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, or in the King James, says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want you to think about that just a little bit. John's testimony says, Look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does Pilate say in our scripture reading this morning? Behold, the man. What's that say? I mean, we could point to any one of us who are male and say, Look, there's a man. But there's more to it than that. Pilate later goes on and says, look, or behold, your king. John's testimony is, look, the Lamb of the God, or the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, and existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus. So I testified, he is the chosen one of God. So he calls him the Lamb of God, and the Chosen One of God. Well, the next day, John is with two of his disciples, and he says the same thing. Look, there is the Lamb of God. So when those two disciples heard and saw, they followed Jesus. They wanted to know. Andrew found his brother Simon He said, we have found the Messiah. And of course, later on, Philip finds uh, Nathaniel and says, we found him. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And of course, you know, Nathaniel, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Philip merely said, come and see for yourself. Check it out. When Nathaniel met Jesus, he too had a testimony. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. John the Baptist continues. And uh, John's disciples came to John the Baptist, and they said, Rabbi, John the Baptist wasn't a rabbi, but he was a teacher, and so they gave him the respectful term, <coughs> Rabbi. The man you met on the other side of the Jordan, the one you identified as the Messiah, he's baptizing more people than you are. And they were a little concerned about, you know, a little competition. He says, he's the Messiah, and he's baptizing more. Everybody is going to him instead of us. Well, John gave a simple answer. He says, look, I've already told you, I'm not the Messiah. He must increase, but I must decrease. Just as a bridegroom is more important than the friend of the bridegroom, so it is with Jesus. He must become greater and greater, I must become less and less. He has, be he has come from above. He's greater than anyone. I'm here on earth. I am not much. He testifies about what he's seen and heard, 
but how few believe that hear him. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he is sent by God. He speaks God's word and God gives him spirit without limit. Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's judgment. Chapter 5 Jesus is talking to people who are wondering about what he is saying. They're not convinced that he's the Messiah, and he says, well, if I were to test my own, on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid, but someone else is also testifying about him, about me. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you've had John the Baptist investigated, and his testimony about me is true. I really don't need human witnesses, but I have a greater witness than John, my teaching and my miracles. The Father gave me greater works to do, and they prove that He sent me. The Father who sent me has testified about me Himself, and you have never heard His voice or seen Him face to face. But you really won't understand His message unless you accept and believe in me. He's saying, if you approve of me, it really doesn't mean anything to me because you don't have God's love within you. I have come in my Father's name. You have rejected me. Yet, if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Well, let's move forward about three years. A little more than three years, Jesus has been arrested. Jesus has been taken before Caiaphas. They had a trial in the early hours of the morning, which was illegal, of course. They were not supposed to have any trials in darkness. It was always supposed to be in daylight, where everybody could see each other. Well, they did this anyway. And then, when they finally had finished, Daylight had come, uh, Pilate had finally gotten up, and they took him to Pilate. So, the accusers, of course, being careful that they could still participate in the Passover service, they didn't actually go into the Roman uh, palace. They just stood on the outside and sent him in. And they said uh, to Pilate, he needs to be tried, he needs to be executed. And, of course, Pilate being uh, a, now you can question this, but Pilate was actually not a bad king. He said, what is your charge against this man? Well, we wouldn't have handed him over to you unless he was a criminal. Trust us. <laughs> Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. And so Pilate went back and talked to uh, Jesus. Are you king of the Jews? Because that was the claim that uh, the priests were saying. He claims to be king of the Jews, therefore he needs to be executed. Well, why would the Jews want somebody who claims to be their king executed? It didn't make sense at all to Pilate. So Jesus asked him, you know, did somebody tell you about this accusation? Or, uh, or is this something you really want to know? Want to know? Again, Pilate asked, what have you done to make them so upset at you? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate then asked, well, if your kingdom is not of this world, then you must be a king if you have a kingdom. Jesus responded, you say I am a king? Actually, I was born and came in this world to testify to the truth. All who love truth will recognize what I say to be true. Pilate gives a response. Well, how can anybody really know truth? So Pilate goes out before the crowd again. Notice he has to go back out because they certainly aren't coming in. They don't want to be defiled. Yet, it's defiling for them to accuse someone. 
to death, yet they don't worry about that. They just don't want to go in forbidden areas. Pilate says he's not guilty of any crime. You've got a custom that I can release someone? Let it be Jesus. And they said, no, not this man. We're not going to do this. Give us Barabbas. Well, Jesus was then flogged. That was customary procedure. They don't want him to be able to uh, cause any trouble. So if you flog them, they'll be so weak and torn up that they're pretty much helpless. Pilate went out again to the people and said, I'm going to bring him out, but understand this very, very clearly. I find him not guilty. Well, don't you agree with Pilate? Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns, a purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here's the man. The leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says, what? I find him not guilty. You go ahead and crucify him. Jewish leaders replied, by our law, he ought to die because he calls himself the Son of God. Now we're getting to the point. It's not that he was claiming to be king of the Jews. He was claiming to be the Son of God. Well, Pilate doesn't understand that part of it. So Pilate goes back inside where Jesus is and... He asked them again, Who are you? Where did you come from? Jesus doesn't answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate says. Don't you realize I have the power to release you or to crucify you? And Jesus says, You have no power over me at all unless God gives it to you. Pilate then works even harder to try to release him. The Jewish leaders won't have it. If you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. Whose side are the people on? Anybody at all, except for Jesus. See how low they're getting? Then, Pilate brings Jesus out one more time. Look, here is your king. People's response, crucify him, crucify him. What? Crucify your king? We don't have any king but Caesar, they said. So Pilate finally turned him over so that he would be crucified. But yet Pilate, being the man that he is, he had a little note written in Latin, in Hebrew, and in Greek put it right above Jesus' head, saying, King of the Jews. And people didn't like that. They said, no, he just claimed to be King of the Jews. He's not really King of the Jews, but Pilate said, I've written what I've written. Pilate, was he a good man? Bad man? He was kind of doing whatever he had to keep the peace. Jesus, to fulfill scripture, said that he was thirsty, accepted of some wine in a sponge, tasted it, bowed his head, and said, it is finished. It was the day of preparation. The Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, a very special Sabbath, because it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering their legs to be broken. When the bodies, then the bodies could be taken down because they would be dead. Soldiers came, broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus, but when they came to Jesus they saw that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear. Immediately blood and water flowed out. This report from the author of this book, John, is an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you may continue to believe. These things happen in fulfillment of scriptures that say, not one of his bones will be broken, and they will look on the one they have pierced. 
So Jesus is presented. We've just covered kind of the highlights on part of it. So when you look at Jesus, what do you see? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Do you see the man? Do you see the, your king? Do you see the Messiah? Or do you see your Messiah? It's something that you need to confront. It's something you need to decide on a daily basis. Who is this Jesus for you? A man? The man? Your king? The Lamb of God? A Messiah? Or your Messiah? It's your choice. You vote with what you decide to do. And one of the voting is participation in communion. You do what God asks you to do. You obey His words and wash each other's feet. Then you come and you take of the bread when He says, This bread represents me. This blood, this grape juice, it represents my life given for you. The question is, will you accept Him and participate? That's the question. If you'd like to participate, let's have the ladies down here, the middle go upstairs.